The initial months of the war saw Japan's primary strength in their capability to swiftly execute a large unified strike involving multiple carriers, all coordinated by a single commander. This allowed for effective and synchronized multi-directional assaults. For example, in the Battle of Midway, Japan efficiently launched 108 planes from four carriers in just seven minutes, and they were on their way to Midway Island in 15 minutes, keeping 107 additional planes ready for potential action against American carriers. This approach, part of Japanese military strategy, though not always strictly followed, involved launching half the aircraft from each carrier to form a combined attack group under one leader while reserving the other half for emergencies or a second attack wave similar to the strategy used at Pearl Harbor. In contrast, the United States struggled to match this efficiency. It took them nearly an hour to launch a comparable strike of 90 aircraft from two carriers, which then moved towards their target, the Japanese carriers, in separate, uncoordinated formations. Both Japan and the United States were capable of preparing about half of their air group for launch. However, Japan's method of integrating planes from various carriers into a single attack group enabled them to launch and proceed to the target much quicker than the United States. After the first wave, the Japanese could prepare for a second wave or wait for new information. The American tactic, on the other hand, required the first half of the strike group to circle and wait for the second half to be ready and launched. This often led to delays and fuel shortages among the first group of aircraft. The American military strategy, similar to Japan's but often not strictly adhered to, suggested that each aircraft carrier and its escorts function as a separate task force. Each air group was to launch its full set of aircraft in an independent strike, potentially coordinated loosely with another carrier's air group. This tactic aimed to prevent the enemy from locating and destroying all carriers simultaneously. However, a significant drawback was the frequent occurrence of uncoordinated attacks and weakened dispersed fighter defenses. Conversely, the Japanese, deeply influenced by Mahanian offensive principles, believed that combining their carriers into one task force would maximize their offensive capabilities and enable a more unified fighter defense. This strategic divergence was a topic of debate in both navies before the war. The American strategy almost led to a loss at Midway, while the Japanese method greatly contributed to their defeat there. In the Japanese Imperial Navy, a carrier division, consisting of two carriers, was a well-coordinated tactical unit, unlike the U.S. Navy, where a carrier division was mainly for administrative purposes. Cardiff 1, Akagi and Kaga, Cardiff 2, Hiryu and Soryu, and Cardiff 5, Shokaku and Zuikaku formed the Kido Butai, Mobile Striking Force. Each Cardiff could operate independently, but dividing a Cardiff or damaging one of its carriers significantly weakened their combat effectiveness. This was evident at the Coral Sea, where such a division led to Zuikaku's absence at Midway. At the onset of the Second World War, the U.S. had seven aircraft carriers, excluding the Langley CV-1, converted to a seaplane tender and lost in early 1942. The Ranger CV-4 was the first dedicated carrier build, but was limited to Atlantic operations. Lexington CV-2 and Saratoga CV-3, both converted from battlecruisers since 1927, served in the Pacific. The Saratoga survived a torpedo attack in early 1942 but missed the Battle of Midway, though parts of its air group participated. The Lexington was lost in the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942. The unique Wasp CV-7 operated in the Atlantic, including delivering Spitfires to Malta, before being sunk in the Pacific by a Japanese submarine in September 1942. The Yorktown-class carriers, Yorktown CV-5, Enterprise CV-6, Hornet CV-8, were considered the most advanced. Yorktown, damaged at Coral Sea, was repaired but later sunk at Midway. The Hornet was lost in late 1942, while the Enterprise survived as one of the most decorated U.S. ships. 
The U.S. launched 17 Essex-class carriers, 9 Independence-class light carriers, and over 100 escort carriers during the war, showcasing unmatched shipbuilding capacity. Japan entered the war with 10 carriers, including 6 major fleet carriers. The Akagi and Kaga, similar to U.S. Lexington and Saratoga, were converted from a battlecruiser and battleship, respectively. Newer carriers like the Hiryu and Soryu were smaller but efficient and fast. All four were destroyed at Midway. The advanced Shokaku and Zuikaku, engaged since Pearl Harbor, were eventually sunk in 1944. Japan's carrier production was limited, with only the Taiho seeing battle before being sunk, and the Shinano, a converted battleship, destroyed before full deployment. Several other carriers were damaged or destroyed in the later stages of the war. In World War II, U.S. Navy carriers typically had larger air groups than their Japanese counterparts, often carrying 60-70 aircraft. This was due to their practice of parking numerous planes on the flight deck. Standard U.S. air groups comprised an 18-plane F-4F Wildcat Fighter Squadron, VF, a 12-18-plane TBD Devastator Torpedo Bomber Squadron, VT, and two SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber Squadrons, 1621 aircraft each, with one designated for bombing, VB, and the other for scouting, VS. Both VB and VS squadrons were employed similarly, often varying only in bomb size and range. The U.S. Navy, however, overly focused on bombing, often overlooking the importance of scouting, despite knowing the tactical advantage of locating the enemy first. U.S. squadrons initially bore numbers matching their carrier's hull number, e.g. VT-8 on USS Hornet, CV-8. An exception was the Yorktown's CV-5 fighter squadron VF-42. By midway, squadrons from Saratoga, CV-3 replaced those from Yorktown, complicating the numbering system. Squadrons were initially identified by their parent carrier, but later a numerical system based on the carrier number was adopted, e.g. CAG-6 on Enterprise, CV-6. Eventually, the system became too complex and was discarded. Squadrons retained their numbers regardless of the carrier. Japanese carriers with two hangar decks did not use deck parking like the United States, resulting in smaller air groups of about 50-60 aircraft. Typically, a Japanese carrier's air group included 18 Mitsubishi A6M2 Type 0, 0 fighters, 21 Aichi D3A1 Type 99 VAL dive bombers, and 21 Nakajima B5N2 Type 97 Kate torpedo bombers. Japanese naval aviation was organized into three-plane Shotai and nine-plane Chutai units, often multiples of three or nine aircraft. Unlike the U.S., Japanese air groups were integral to their respective carriers, hindering flexibility in reassigning groups between carriers. This limitation was evident when the Zuikaku, though undamaged at Coral Sea, couldn't rapidly reform an air group for Midway. Additionally, Japan struggled to replace aircraft lost to operational attrition, leading to fewer planes embarked on carriers during significant battles like Coral Sea and Midway. Japan also prioritized bombing over scouting, relying heavily on floatplanes and flying boats for reconnaissance, a decision that proved costly in battles such as Coral Sea and Midway. Fighters the F-4F Wildcat was outclassed by the Japanese Zero in maneuverability, dogfighting, and range. Wildcats engaging directly with Zeros often faced quick defeat. However, the Wildcat boasted stronger armament, better armor, self-sealing fuel tanks, superior radio, and greater durability. With the adoption of appropriate tactics, emphasizing teamwork and dive-and-run attacks, and with skilled pilots, Wildcats could effectively counter Zeros. When bypassing or outmaneuvering Zeros, Wildcats were adept at targeting Japanese dive and torpedo bombers. Torpedo Bombers Initially, both the U.S. and Japan regarded torpedoes as the most effective naval weapons. The TBD Devastator, introduced in 1937, was once the forefront of carrier bombers but by 1942 was outperformed by the superior Japanese B-5N2 Kate. 
direct comparisons are less relevant than their performance against defenses. The Kate was faster, with a more effective torpedo that could be launched from higher altitudes and speeds, offering it an edge in survivability. However, Wildcats could effectively target Kates. The TBD's major flaw was its torpedo, requiring a dangerously slow and low approach, making it vulnerable to enemy actions. Additionally, the torpedo's slow speed allowed targets to evade it easily. U.S. aerial torpedoes also suffered from frequent detonation failures. Dive bombers, both the SBD Dauntless and the Japanese VAL, were highly effective in their roles. The VAL, despite its dated appearance with fixed landing gear, matched the SBD in performance, offering longer range and a smaller yet effective payload. Its non-folding wings limited the size of Japanese air groups. The SBD, like the Wildcat, was robust and could withstand significant damage, increasing the risk to attacking Zeros. Its maneuverability allowed it to be used in anti-torpedo bomber and anti-submarine roles in some U.S. air wings. During the Second World War's early stages, the anti-aircraft defenses of U.S. carriers were notably inadequate, and those of Japanese carriers were even less effective. Neither side possessed AAA weapons capable of efficiently countering dive bombers, and they were only somewhat effective against torpedo bombers. Generally, the defensive armaments couldn't engage enemy aircraft effectively before they released their bombs or torpedoes. In battles like Coral Sea and Midway, most losses for both sides were due to enemy fighters or fuel exhaustion, with only a few attributed to AAA fire. At the time of Coral Sea and Midway, U.S. carriers and some cruisers were equipped with radar, an advantage not yet available to Japanese ships. Though still developing, radar-directed fighter control was employed by the U.S., but it struggled under mass attacks. U.S. strategy involved maintaining cruisers and destroyers in a close circular formation around carriers for additional AAA support. This tactic became more effective later in the war with improved weaponry but initially often led to increased collision risks during evasive maneuvers, with Japanese aircraft exploiting gaps between ships. Conversely, the Japanese relied heavily on drastic maneuvering as their primary defense against air attacks, aside from fighter support. Japanese escort ships maintained distance to allow carriers ample room for maneuvering. These escorts lacked sufficient AAA for their defense or the carriers. Without radar, Japanese escorts were positioned further from the carriers at the horizon for visual early warning of incoming attacks. When a raid was spotted, the escorts would fire their main batteries to signal the direction of attack to their fighters, compensating for the unreliability of the limited radio equipment in Japanese aircraft. The U.S. Navy's damage control capabilities were significantly better than Japan's, a fact underscored by lessons learned from the loss of the Lexington at Coral Sea and the Pearl Harbor attack. U.S. ships improved safety measures, such as removing paint buildups that had contributed to intense fires early in the war. The U.S. also rapidly integrated new lessons, as demonstrated when the Yorktown at Midway used CO2 to flood aviation fuel lines, preventing the secondary explosions that had doomed Lexington. In contrast, although the Japanese recognized the vulnerability of aviation fuel lines on the Shokaku at Coral Sea and saved the ship, they failed to disseminate these crucial lessons, a factor in the loss of four carriers at Midway. Japanese carriers assigned damage control exclusively to a specialized engineering team, often the first casualties in explosions, leaving untrained crew members to battle fires valiantly but ineffectively, often at a high cost in lives. Unlike the US, Japan lacked a system of damage control conditions, such as yoke and zebra, and an effective damage control central. A major design flaw in Japanese carriers was their completely enclosed hangar bays. Unlike the U.S. carriers' partially open bays with rolling partitions, this difference meant that while U.S. carriers could warm up aircraft engines in the hangar, Japanese carriers could not, leading them to fuel aircraft in the hangar and then move them to the flight deck for engine warming.
Consequently, explosions in Japanese hangar bays combined with the presence of fueled aircraft resulted in catastrophic outcomes as seen at Midway. This reflects a broader theme in Japanese naval strategy where offense was prioritized over defense, a mindset that initially brought success but eventually led to severe losses and strategic failures.